Okay, hi everyone. Thanks for the good introduction. I don't have to introduce so much. So the takeaway from my talk is already the title slide, magnetic breaking and closed binary saturates. If it's not clear what that means, then you have to keep paying attention. So here are two pictures of the sun. Here in the extreme UV, you can see gas in the corona. And then here in the optical, but during an eclipse, you can see Thompson scattering of photosphere, elect, uh, photosphere photons off of free electrons. And in both cases, the takeaways are there's material leaving the sun. And especially clear on the right side, it's flowing along the magnetic field lines. And so what are the consequences of that? Well, if you imagine a, a parcel of solar wind, as long as it's being held by the magnetic field, which is turning with the star uh, and co-rotating with the star, its angular velocity as it goes out is fixed. And so its physical velocity and its, its angular momentum is increasing as it goes out. And so if you imagine a piece of solar wind co-rotates with the star until it gets to some radius, which I call RA, which stands for alpha in radius, if that is bigger than the radius of the star, then the wind will carry away angular momentum. And so if this goes on for a while, eventually the star will spin down. And already more than, than uh, 50 years ago, it was observed that this seems to happen. So Skumanich in 1972 measured ages and rotation velocities of solar type stars, found that they sit on a relation like this. That's the basis of what's called gyrochronology, that for some types of stars, you can measure how old they are based on how fast they're spinning. Uh, and for, for solar type stars, that's what we, or for single stars, that's what we mean by magnetic breaking. If you have a binary, it's a little more complicated. So if I take a star like the sun or a lower mass one and put it in a binary with say a white dwarf or with another star, you know, if the star has a magnetic field and it's spinning, the same thing will happen. The star says, I want to spin down. Uh, but if you're in a close binary and you're tidally locked, in practice means less than say 10 days or five days, the other star says, no, you can't spin down because uh, your rotation period is locked to the orbital period. And the first star says, well, I, I have to spin down. I'm losing this angular momentum to winds. That's not going to stop. And so the only solution is instead to lose, to take angular momentum from the orbit instead. And over time, this brings a detached uh, binary into contact. And so that's why we like magnetic breaking, because it gives us an opportunity to take a binary that's not really doing anything and bring it close enough that something interesting starts to happen. And then once mass transfer starts, magnetic breaking is going to set what the mass transfer rate is, uh, how long the system lives, and many of its observational properties, you know, as long as it's dominating over gravitational waves, which we think uh, in, in white dwarf binaries at, at periods more than, than at least uh, three or so hours, it probably is. Uh, so, can we just calculate how this works? Well, you can go back to this kind of cartoon. And you say, well, if I know, uh, I know the expression for angular momentum, or right? it's MVR, and I just say, well, V is, is, uh, is uh, the radius that you get out to times 2 pi times, uh, or divided by the rotation period. You ha have a simple expression for what the angular momentum loss rate due to this kind of process should be. You say, well, we just calculate this. Uh, the problem is we don't really know the mass loss rate from winds very well, and we don't really know the alpha and radius. Uh, and so you can say, well, you know, the alpha and radius probably depends on the magnetic field, and it probably depends on the wind mass loss rate. It also depends a little bit on the, the mass and radius of the star because you care about the escape velocity. But then the, the wind mass loss rate, that depends on the magnetic field also and on the rotation rate and mass and radius. And the magnetic field, that depends on the mass and radius, but also on how fast you're spinning. And so for most of the, the historical modeling of CVs, people have just said, you know, this is too complicated. We have too many parameters we don't know. Uh, instead, let's just try for an empirical solution, which is we can look at how fast single stars are spinning down. So if you take this Skumanich relation, uh, this uh, uh, is empirically found that the rotation period goes as about t to the one half. And so if you say, I want to know what angular momentum loss it takes to reproduce this, right, you say angular momentum is just i omega, and i is, is mr squared. Uh, you have a differential equation, and with a few lines of, of algebra, you can solve uh, for what 
uh, j dot you need, and you get a magnetic breaking torque that's m uh, r to the fourth and p to the minus three. That will reproduce this kind of spin down for single stars. And if you now put that in a binary, uh, which you know people uh, uh, have been doing for a long time, uh, really going. Uh, I think the paper that made it most popular was this Rappaport et al. paper in 1983. You get evolution that looks like this. Uh, so here I take a binary that starts with an orbital period of three days, uh, and it, it shrinks because of magnetic breaking. And at first it shrinks pretty slowly because the torque from magnetic breaking isn't that strong. But as it gets closer, the stars spin faster, and so the torque gets even stronger. Uh, and so they, the evolution accelerates. And at the end, the star is spinning f so fast that the torque is really strong that it doesn't spend very much time at any given period for short periods. That's because of this p to the minus 3 scaling. Uh, and so it, it's become very popular to use this, this kind of equation in binary evolution models because it's simple. You know, it's based on, on something we kind of understand. Uh, and so most of the classic papers for the CV evolutionary model assume a magnetic breaking like this. And same for models of low mass X-ray binaries. We have a neutron star accretor. You know, if you've ever run a binary evolution calculation in MESA, you've probably assumed this. The, the BSE code that's used a lot in populations in this uses this. But it's important to remember, right, this is based on slowly rotating solar type stars. They're rotating much slower than the stars in CVs or LMXBs, and typically they're higher masses. And so it's not obvious that it'll still work uh, in closer binaries. And so what I've been looking at is, can we test this relation uh, using observations of main sequence binaries. You say, how would you test that? You say, well, suppose uh, you start with some binary population that has a period distribution that looks like this. Uh, you know, just a flat birth period distribution. And then I'll assume a constant star formation rate, so I'll keep forming binaries and I'll evolve them uh, according to that magnetic breaking law. And pretty soon you reach an equilibrium where you get a, a period distribution that you actually observe it looks like this. So the main feature is you don't have very many binaries at short periods because by the time they get to short periods, they're evolving quickly until they come into contact. And you say, well, that doesn't seem that useful because you had to start by knowing the birth period distribution, which you might not know. But it turns out uh, you're actually not very sensitive to the birth period distribution. So here I assume a different distribution that actually has most of the binaries forming at close periods, and still you get a big shortage of binaries at close periods just because the lifetime by the time they get there is so short uh, that everything that makes the short periods is just passing through on its way into coming into contact if this magnetic breaking law holds. So to test this, uh, I went to Gaia and ZTF, so I'll consider all uh, stars within 500 parsecs that have good ZTF light curves with a lot of uh, data points that are bright enough, quali good quality flags and stuff like that. And I'll run box least squared to look for eclipses. Uh, and then I have a lot of eclipsing light curves. It's, this was a very boring stage of the process to look through like 20,000 of these to see which ones are actually eclipsing light uh, eclipsing binaries. But even though it's, it's, it's boring, uh, this is a good sample for this kind of test because the selection function is pretty easy to understand. It's basically just set by geometry what eclipses and what doesn't. Uh, it's different from, say, if I wanted to do the same kind of test with CVs, where what I detect depends on how bright something is, which depends on the mass transfer rate. Um, so so uh, there, there are lots of parts of the problem that I think are simpler in this case. So I, I, at the end, I get a sample of detached eclipsing binaries with like curves like that all across the lower HR diagram, split it into, bins of, into five bins of mass, where the lowest mass bin is both stars are fully convective, and then at, at higher masses, they become partially convective with, with smaller and smaller convective zones. Uh, I also do injection recovery tests where I inject eclipses with, with different popu uh, distributions of, of uh, mass ratios and things like that into the light curves and see what I can recover. And so what's shown here on the right side is the actual observed period distributions, and then on top of that, the dashed lines. Uh, or the detection probability. And so if I divide one by the other, I get sort of the incompleteness corrected period distribution, which looks like this. This is the main result in the periods where magnetic breaking is expected to dominate the orbital evolution. It's very flat. And so 
what's shown here in the dashed line is what you would expect if the magnetic, if the period distribution were set by this Rappaport Skumanich magnetic breaking. And it's just a huge disagreement, right? This predicts that at a period of two days, you should have 200 times more binaries than at a period of 0.2 days, but you have the same number. Uh, and it's, it's true across all mass spins. And so this tells us pretty strongly that these binaries are not evolving according to a magnetic breaking law that goes p to the minus a third. What you need to get a flat distribution is something like p to the minus two thirds. Sorry, not p to the minus three, more like p to the minus two thirds. And then we ask, how can you get p to the minus two thirds? Uh, one way you can do it, which there have been suggestions from studies of single stars could work, is if magnetic breaking saturates at fast periods. And what that means basically is that for slow rotators, when you spin out the star faster, the magnetic field gets stronger and magnetic breaking gets stronger, but eventually you spin the star faster and the magnetic field doesn't get any stronger. And there are lots of independent pieces of evidence that this might happen from observations of single stars. Uh, things like the H alpha luminosities, the X-ray luminosities, the flare rates, the magnetic flux observed for single stars, uh, they all increase at short periods, or, 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 sorry, at long periods for slow rotators, they increase as you spin it up, and then they reach a plateau. And so that's where the saturated magnetic breaking law came from. Of course, saturated is a fairly broad term, uh, but we use uh, one law that, that was introduced by these two papers, Shaboy 95 and, and Sills in 2000. Uh, and if you implement that into CVs, Diogo talked about this a little bit. Uh, you know, one effect is that compared to the standard model, your mass expected mass transfer rate goes down quite a bit. You could say, well, you know, it looks like it's matching these systems, not this one. Uh, in reality, it's probably complicated because there's such a huge dispersion in observed mass transfer rates at fixed period that, that one law can't match all of them. Uh, but the important thing is that at these periods above the period gap, uh, we predict a much lower uh, angular momentum loss rate than in the standard model. And you can increase that a little bit with, with the kind of consequential angular momentum models that Diogo talked about, but uh, they, they don't predict this big of a, of a difference. So, there, you know, there has to be something else to it. So if you assume this, many things about CD evolution change. One is the typical lifetimes during mass transfer. Are, are longer, you know, by something like a, a factor of 30. Uh, that means the donors come closer to being in thermal equilibrium rather than out of thermal equilibrium. Uh, and yeah, they said the mass transfer rates go down. So I'm not the first person to make a claim like this. There was a paper 20 years ago now that pointed this out based not on observations of eclipsing binaries, but observations of single stars that look, they look like their magnetic breaking is, is uh, saturated. Uh, and so they also said that predicts that CV donors should be out of thermal, sorry, should be in thermal equilibrium. Uh, but I don't think that's really a solution at, because from observations of just the donors in CVs and their masses and radii, there's pretty strong evidence that they are in fact out of thermal equilibrium, I think. Um, and so uh, what I'm interested in is, you know, how can we reconcile this, these observations for detached binaries with mass transfer systems, right? What's the difference? Uh, and, and one uh, sort of possibility, which, which is still sort of phenomenological, uh, but is, it, you know, is there some process associated with the mass transfer that could be dominating the angular momentum rather than magnetic breaking? And so there are a bunch of possibilities that have been proposed here. Uh, I just put up one plot from a, a nice paper by Savon Ginsburg, who gave a talk this morning, uh, that was arguing, you know, maybe irradiation of the donor following novae or iteration of the donor in general could puff it up in a way that you don't get in a detached binary and increase the mass transfer rate there. But there's, there's a lot more work to be done to figure out uh, what it takes. Uh, so yeah, here's my summary. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Questions? No questions at all? You answered all the questions. Mm -hmm. I, I have one question, mm -hmm. which I think we talked about already. So does your observation of the main sequence binaries actually constrain the strengths or the dependence or right. both? Right. So the, if we only look at the period distribution, you're sensitive to how the torque depends on period. Uh, but uh, 
and especially if it's saturated, you're not really sensitive to the absolute normalization of the magnetic breaking law, because for a saturated uh, magnetic breaking law, everything just moves inward, and you don't know what the initial theory distribution was. So the normalization of the, the law that I showed is set by observations of single stars and clusters, where you know how old the cluster is, you know roughly how, uh, you know, you have an idea of how fast the stars are, are, are born spinning. Uh, but those observations also suggest that it's complicated. You know, at fixed age, there's a pretty big range of rotation rates. Yeah, I agree. Okay. Uh, given that the normalization is uncertain, how, how much of a problem is it above the period gap? Like, do you think you could play with a factor of 30? <laughs> Well, so, so if you just increase it by a factor of 30 for everything, then there would be no rapidly rotating stars in clusters that are tens or hundreds of millions of years old, which there are. Um, so the, the saturation uh, period is already, like that would be a problem for them? Like that's not too fast rotating? Right, so yeah, the thing about the, satura the saturation period is at least for CVs, everything is well into the saturated regime. For a half a solar mass star, it's like five days or something like that, the transition to the saturated regime. So that would be a problem for the field, for the field and the clusters. Yeah. yeah. No more questions. CV people, this is changing everything. <laughs> um, so do you see any any way to have a discontinuity in angular momentum loss to make a period gap? I, because you said maybe no versus irradiation, but that shouldn't be discontinuous at three hours. That's right. Um, so I, I, it's although we don't see any big difference in the in the period distributions across the the point. 0.4 to 0.3 to 0.2 mass range. I don't. Th our results aren't inconsistent with the normalization just getting weaker from higher masses to lower masses. Uh, so I like it is still possible that if for some reason the normalization above the period gap is is higher than what you infer from single stars, that it then gets weaker while staying saturated at 0.3 solar masses. Um, my my personal hot take is that I think a lot of the Subperiod minimum TVs just formed from donors that that were were never in contact above the period gap, but but uh, you know just came out of common envelope at, at with a with a 0.2 solar mass donor. Over there. Okay. At some point, Alfin radius may become larger than the Roche lobe. And at that point, magnetic braking will have to switch to a different regime. Can you comment on that? Yeah, so actually most CVs are in that regime where the, you know, if, if, you, if you try to use a toy model to predict what the Alfin radius is, it's bigger than the binary. So you shouldn't really be treating the, the components as independent of each other. My guess is what happens then depends on what kind of white dwarf you have, right? If the white dwarf is magnetic, then maybe the mag you know half of the open field lines connect to the white dwarf, and so you lose less angular momentum because you have fewer open field lines. Um, I think if the white dwarf is not magnetic, you know, probably it, it being there still changes the dynamics a little bit. But I, I, yeah, my 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 guess my guess would be in the case of the non-magnetic white dwarf, it doesn't make a huge difference. Okay, I'm I'm not a binary person. Uh, so that that didn't sound that right. Sorry, uh, binary with a white dwarf uh, a researcher. Mm -hmm. um, but um, a few years ago, there was a paper. I don't remember the first author, but it was Ivanova related, and they proposed um, a magnetic breaking that it was like more parameters than the Rappaport or Skumanich uh, law that depended on mass transfer and rotation. And, and if I remember correctly, 
um, the convection time scale uh, since you you talk about different regimes for fully convective or almost fully convective stars um, and uh, one of those parameters I think the convection time scale dependent on on Reynolds number I should remember this I have a physics degree and, Wasp number I think. <laughs> And actually, that, that number kind of showed a saturation value that was almost the same that you showed there. You, you have a look at that, or you, or you are considering a magnetic braking uh, from Rappaport? So, yeah, so I think the paper you're thinking of, it's Van and Ivanova. They had a series of papers, especially trying to explain low mass x ray binaries. But the thing is, uh, I may have a figure showing that one. Yeah, so here's the Van and Ivanova paper. They're, they actually have a, the same scaling with period in, as is the Rapport one, and the normalization at the relevant period is even higher because they were, they were trying to explain these persistent LMXBs where you need a high mass transfer rate. And so even more strongly than we rule out the Rapport one, we rule out this one as explaining most binaries because they would, you know, they would predict that once you have a binary at half a day period, it will merge within like a million years. You would just never see them in the main sequence population. It is possible that in, on, that in some cases magnetic breaking is just stronger for, you know, if the star is especially magnetic, but it can't explain the majority of the population. Okay, thanks Karim. Yeah.